from Kansas City, Missouri, this is GovLove, a podcast about local government. I'm Lauren Palmer, the Director of Local Government Services for the Mid-America Regional Council and your host for this episode. GovLove is produced by ELGL, the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. Today I'm visiting with Hannah Zacharias, Robert A. Kipp Professor of Practice at the University of Kansas School of Public and Administration. Hannes transitioned to academia in 2018 after an impressive career spanning every level of government at federal, state, county, and city. Today, we are discussing his work at KU to inspire emerging public administrators to create high-performance organizations built on cultures of improvement. Hannes, welcome to GovLove. Thank you, Lauren. Nice to be here and wonderful to talk to your listeners in GovLove. Great opportunity. Likewise, we are thrilled to have you. So, Hannes, we're going to start with a lightning round to get to know you a little bit better. So my first question is, what is a food that you hate but most people enjoy? You know, I I, I really don't hate anything. I was taught to go and eat everything put in front of me. Uh, We're from an immigrant family from Germany, so uh, I I really don't hate anything as far as that's concerned, which really kind of has led to a problem for me overeating because I eat everything on my plate. Gosh, I have that affliction too. I do not like. uh, And one thing I do not like... I'm not sure if others like it as well, is boiled chitlins. I got this with regards to, I, when I was city manager in Boonville, Missouri, a very strong minority population, African-Americans, and I would go out frequently to soul food dinners, which is fabulous, um, but came across boiled chitlins, and it was just not agreeable to me. It's an acquired taste, as we know, that's uh, basically a large intestines, large swine intestines cooked up in ways. But that did not appeal to me. I, I can take fried and those sort of things, but boiled chitlins just did not appeal. To me. So that's why. Well, you, you said it's an acquired taste. Maybe you just haven't acquired it yet. Just that's exactly do right. Do a little more time. Yeah, but I'll tell you, the, the, the soul food dinners were terrific. Uh, the fried catfish and the chicken and the pies, oh, yeah. just awesome. Great, great community. Oh, very cool. Um, all right. Well, next question. If you could meet any famous person, who would it be and why? You know, there's so many to choose from. I think the one that I wrestled with is finally is Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and for all the reasons that you might might suspect, uh, you know, obviously the, the work as, as president as well and the drafting of the Declaration of Independence. But for me, it's also about his purchase, uh, the Louisiana Purchase. And most intriguing, I'd like to ask him is, what does it feel like? Or what did it feel like to receive all these packages from the core of discovery? Uh, that when they came on your doorstep, I mean, they they brought him the first prairie dogs and so forth. How did you feel about that? And what was it like to kind of get this periscope of a new land coming on your doorsteps at Monticello? Um, so that's, I would like to have a conversation with him. It's because they keep such a worldly person and the, the person who started the uh, Library of Congress with his own personal collection. I think he'd just be a fasting person to visit. Yeah, I think that's a good one. You know, we're both from the Midwest here in Missouri and Kansas and um, yeah, the, the history and kind of the legend of the Lewis and Clark expedition is so much embedded in the history and the culture, I think in Missouri and along the Missouri river. And I just find that all fascinating. It's almost like defies comprehension what they did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you ever invent or find a time machine and get to go back and have that conversation, please take me with you or take good notes. Well, exactly right. And along with that, it'd be good to kind of have, you know, actually Lewis and Clark to talk with them both and be a fly on the wall for some of their, their adventures in Fort Clatsop and so forth. Uh, just fascinated with all that. So that, that'd be a person I'd like to go and visit with among a whole host of other people that I'd love to go and have a conversation with. For sure. All right. And one more question. Tell us about the best movie or book that you read or saw this year. It's getting to the end of the year. So if you reflect back on um, the yeah. literature and movies that you digested, which one was your favorite? There, there were several out there that were favorite. But I guess the one that, that strikes me right off the bat is a, a book that I had to go and review and do for High Plains Public Radio to kind of do some, uh, do some book reports on that. And the book was called uh, A Line Becomes a River, Dispatches from the Border uh, by Francisco Cantu. And what it is is a story. He's a, a U.S. Border Patrol member, officer, and he talks about the immigrants crossing over in, in the last few years and the trials and travails they had of that immigrant population and the internal struggle he has about being a, a, a Border Patrol officer but also having relatives uh, in Mexico that were trying to uh, escape a terrible you know, lifestyle over the United States. So I thought that was a fascinating book and one that kind of gave me an insight uh, into um, that part of the population we don't often think about, at least I don't often think about. 
um, which was good. Probably what I'm reading now is a lot of books on, on uh, or some books on uh, on the rivers. So I'm I'm reading Mark Twain's uh, uh, Life on the Mississippi because uh, I just I I like rivers and those sort of things and have read several books about Midwest rivers as well the last year. But uh, the uh, uh, a line becomes a river dispatches from the border stuck with me. A line becomes a river. Okay, I'm always looking for good book recommendations. Yeah, so dis- I'm writing that down. Line becomes a river dispatches from the border. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sounds like a good read. All right. Well, now let's get into the heart of our interview. Honest, we usually always start by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about their background and their career trajectory. So, um, you know, for you, someone with a legendary 40 plus year career in local government, um, share with our listeners, but just remember this is like a 45 minute podcast. So we're going to just need the highlights of all the incredible work that you've done in your well, public service career. I'm, I'm humbled that you think it's been, been illustrious and so forth. It really has been a, been a wonderful ride for me, however. I started out uh, in, the, in the public service profession out of college, becoming a lobbyist uh, and uh, working with the Kansas legislature, representing all the college students to the Board of Regents, which was fascinating. That then migrated into a position with the Kansas Department of Travel and Tourism as their assistant director, which was great. There were only two of us in the entire office, so I was the one that drove the van across the state of Kansas, but it gave me a good insight into all the history of Kansas, which is just formidable in in my view, uh, growing up in Dodge City, that legendary community as well. That led to a position then with the Department of Commerce and Housing out of Washington, D.C., doing economic development grants for the state of Kansas, industrial park feasibility studies, those sort of things. One project we worked on uh, was dealing about wind regime studies where we could plant uh, windmills to provide power for oil rigs. That didn't go very far, but that same study now has been the template for putting out all the f- wind farms in Kansas, which is kind of a nice uh-huh. residual, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but the, that was during the Reagan administration, and we were one of the first agencies to be terminated under his administration, so that sent me packing. I then became the assistant director for the Kansas Arts Commission. I wanted to become an actor, but because I'm, I, I'm not... Uh, uh, I'm not, I don't fit the profile of many actors. That didn't go anywhere. Pursued my MPA, was fortunate to get that done. I wanted to then try to go work for NASA. Thought that'd be kind of a good thing to go ahead and do. Was a presidential management intern alternate. Applied for a position also in the city of Lawrence uh, as a management analyst. Got that position the same day. Then I got a call from DC and said, hey, we have an opening come to you to come to NASA, and I said, no, I already accept this position in the city of Lawrence, and that turned the thing for me. Wow. I got a chance to work in local government, working with downtown redevelopment in the city of Lawrence, Kansas. Those of you who know, Lawrence, Kansas really transformed itself from fairly modest downtown to one that really is one of the best downtowns, I'd argue, in a medium to small town community with a university population. And I had the chance to go ahead and work with Buford Watson. Those who listen to the podcast may know his name, former president of ICMA. And also there's a, an award named after him for mentoring assistance during his career. Uh, and I got to be with him during his presidency with ICMA. And that got me contacts, people all across the country in the ICMA world. Uh, after four years there in Lawrence, got a chance to be Boonville manager, city manager in Boonville, Missouri, worked on the Katy Trail. New river, a new bridge over the Missouri River, which were formidable events. Then got a chance to go to Kansas and to Hayes, Kansas. We actually call it Hayes, America, um, as the place that uh, that deals with water issues. And uh, there's not enough time here. Won't do it about water issues, but I can talk about purifying water, taking wastewater into drinking water standards, harvesting water out of clouds. I've water witched uh, with rods as foes forth. So a great deal of information about water and water conservation. Then about 20 years, had a chance to go ahead and become the assistant county manager for Johnson County. And going from a western Kansas community to a larger community of 600,000 and an organization of 1.1, now $1.6 billion and 4,000 employees was a big change for me. And had the good fortune to go from assistant county manager, deputy county manager, and then county manager for about 10 years as well with that great organization. And had a great time to work with Mid-America Regional Council as well. I've gone way too long, but I got to kind of give you some sense and and now working for University of Kansas. Hey, there's so much there, Hannes. Thank you for that rundown. Thanks for a shout out for Mark there. And um, 
you know, I'm glad you mentioned water issues. We will have you back on the podcast as a repeat cast and just do a separate issue. Just talking about water issues. Our, our frequent listeners will know that I have a mild obsession with issues around water reclamation in the West. I'm fascinated by it. So uh, we'll talk about that some more on another day. Love and, to do um, it. Love to do I had it. never, I had never heard that story before about um, narrowly missing the presidential management fellowship. Like, yeah. Yeah. Take, I, I, I was an intern. I was a, an alternate and then somebody dropped out. Uh, and the, the same day I accepted the, the, the position with Lawrence and changed my <laughs> professional trajectory in a happy way. Yeah. Listen, kids, if NASA calls, say, no, thank you. You're going to local <laughs> government. It'll That's change exactly your life. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. I think it's great. Well, you've done so much in your career. This may be a hard question for you to answer, but what is your proudest professional co- accomplishment from your time in local government? Oh, there have been so many capital redevelopment projects going on. I, I, it's hard to say, you know, water for downtown, for Hayes has been important, downtown development in Lawrence and also Boonville developing parks, libraries, and a new courthouse in, in Johnson County. Uh, uh, I don't have any plaques on those, and nor do I deserve that. Uh, but given all that sort of stuff and made, I think, an improvement, I hopefully leaving the communities better than I found it, the most proud, uh, I think, advancement I have uh, that I've done in my career uh, is to advance a culture of high performance in the Johnson County organization uh, and really trying to create a place where the culture encourages everyone to go and bring the full measure of their talents to work every day and to do so for a common purpose, that being the Athenian oath to kind of uh, to do it places better than they found it. So I, that's, I feel most proud about that. I will also add to your listeners, so for the, nothing I've ever done in my career is it been a solo act. It's done with everybody else. I've had a good fortune of working with tremendous people and I've had great fortune to work in environments where I've had to make a difference and roll up my sleeve and, and work hard and I think made some positive changes. Um, but uh, I don't do all these. I was fortunate to be with others to help them also move the ball along uh, as well. I, I think that's really inspiring what you said. You know, when we think in terms of accomplishments, I think it's really easy for people's brains to instantly go to bricks and mortar and big buildings and big transportation projects. But I think it's really special that for you, it, it comes down to culture and organizational development. And that's what really um, made a difference and mattered. So I, I think that's inspiring for our listeners that, um, Sometimes it's it's the internal that can make the most difference externally. So thanks for well, sharing I, that. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think that additionally that there's uh, uh, going in the various communities I've been at, uh, I, I have the good fortune to reflect upon, you know, that project may not have gone as well without some efforts that I put toward it. Uh, but there's no plaques needed. But did I leave the community better than I found it? Are they are they better off than they were when I first came there? And knowing that there are great talent people that follow me as well. As well, uh, early in my career, I thought, well, geez, if I leave a community, gosh, they're going to miss me and so forth. I've now come to be more wise to understand everybody is in the right place they need to be at, their, at that point in time. And they're all doing their level best to go and do its best for the community. And hats off to them and those continuing that kind of work. Yeah, great. Well, I'm going to turn that question a little bit. If okay. you could get one do-over for any project or issue from your local government career, what would it be? And maybe tell us what you learned from that experience that would be helpful for our audience. Well, you know, nobody's perfect. And early on in my in my career, one of the communities I, I worked with, uh, that was uh, there was a desire to remove a downtown structure that had been in a fire. And so the city council said, well, go out and get bids for that and, and get a demolition going. So we did uh, do that and uh, had some really professional organizations submitted. But there was a gentleman who decided, said, who had a dump truck and a chain and says, I can take down the building and uh, just let me do it. And, and uh, I provided all the information I could to say this probably is not a reputable group, doesn't really have all the expertise. Uh, but as city councils are ought to do, they wanted to go low bid and said, well, what, what could go wrong? So we required the person to have insurance and so forth. Unfortunately, that person did not have valid insurance, started taking it down and, and ended up kind of hurting the neighboring building, uh, which we finally ended up working and those sort of things and nobody got hurt. But what that taught me is that, that uh, first of all, you know, low bid's not always the best bid, but more importantly, don't leave the community vulnerable. Um, I, I messed up by not really... Um, ensuring that the, the insurance was, was valid, and although they said he, he said it was, 
Um, and uh, our job is to make sure that uh, we go ahead and uh, um, provide uh, an environment where, where indeed we anticipate the worst and prepare for the best. Uh, and I think that Tommy to go always kind of uh, make sure what could, what's the worst that could happen and prepare for that. Uh, because our responsibility is to make sure communities are, are, are protected in the best way that we can. Great example. Don't leave the community vulnerable. That's going to stick with me. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your current role now at KU. Um, tell us about your position. What is a professor of practice? Uh, my current it's professor of practice really is the... Uh, in, individual that makes the bridge between the academic world and the uh, application world. Really kind of take the academic learnings and put them into practical context because our profession it relies a great deal on uh, on our ethical and, and the information we bring forward, our competencies, but also what's important is how to practically apply that into real life situations. It is an art as much of a science as what we say. So I talk a lot about the art. How are the relationships really established? How does it feel to go out and be in a contentious city council uh, meeting? Uh, what's it like to really kind of have uh, issues of, of face masks and really kind of constituents that are really kind of railing at, at, the, at the podium and so forth? So it really is trying to provide that translation, if you will, and that additional learning. Uh, so when people go into the field, they have some background and some comfort that uh, we've seen it before, um, which really does that. So uh, that that's kind of uh, that that's the current position. Um, I, I might tell you that you know the the uh, uh, the reason why I'm doing this kind of work, um, what what led me to my current position is by virtue of my kayak trip that I did following my leaving of the job in Johnson County. I decided to go ahead and pursue, uh, follow a drop of water from the Continental Divide in Colorado all the way down the uh, Arkansas River. We call it Arkansas in Kansas versus the Arkansas River, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And I had done it before as a younger lad, and I had a chance to do it again the second time. Why well, I tell you that, I emerged from that 100 uh, day expedition, I'll use that or uh, adventure, uh, with four big buckets I wanted to do in my life uh, for, the, for the next chapter of my life. I'll use that person. One thing is to go ahead and establish my relations with my family and friends and really expand upon that. And your listeners will appreciate this. I had to learn it late in life. The only thing that's non-renewable is time. And we have to go ahead and use it wisely as we go forward. So I wanted to uh, make up for lost time. This profession is hard on my family. And I want to make up that time with my family to, to kindle and amplify my relationship with my family and friends. The second thing really is to advocate for the Arkansas River and for environmental concerns generally. Uh, just to let you know, it is the uh, seventh longest river in the country, the 45th longest in the river in the world. And for 14% of its time, it's totally dry by virtue of irrigation during my lifetime. So that's a concern for me. The third area is talking about, I want to be part of establishing a culture of caring for the Kansas City region, uh, which I have a strong affinity for all 2.5 million people in, the, in this region. And I think we want to be good actors on the world stage. And if we don't care about downtown Kansas City with the rural parts of Kansas City, we're not going to be the community we could be. And fourth, and most importantly for being a professor of practice, is I want to help uh, build and reinforce the current and next generation of public servants. Because uh, I think that really is the salvation for our democracy. I'll use that term probably too strongly, but a major player for our democracy, what happens at the local level and want to make sure that happens. So that's what I do, and that's also why I do it. That's so great. So I know that you teach an executive level seminar about creating a culture of high performance. You talked about doing that work in Johnson County. What is a high performance organization? Tell us what you mean when you're talking about that. A high performance organization, it creates the culture where, as I said before, everybody feels like they have the psychological safety and have the encouragement to bring their full talents to work every day. Um, and I, I will explain it this way. We all know, I, I would suspect for everybody listening, uh, that in the first few minutes of you going to a new organization, you felt what the culture was going to be like. Am I going to be accepted? Am I are my ideas going to be nurtured? Uh, am I going to have a chance to grow my talents and to be able to uh, be able to progress in my career path? Uh, and you can know that like in the first few minutes. Typically, what happens is uh, we we provide environments where we. Uh, uh, we have great talent, but we put them into a caustic environment. So it really is trying to go and create the environment where people can 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 feel like they are fully appreciated and fully engaged. Uh, the f fundamentally, we're trying to uh, establish that the distinction between management and leadership. 
Uh, management really is about things in my viewpoint. Certainly people are part of that as well, but leadership is all about people. Uh, we establish management as a way to go ahead and get consistent performance, uh, whatever it might be. We, we, need to, we need to produce the roads need to be plowed, needs to be done on a regular basis, uh, et cetera. And we, have, we establish what we call system strategies and structures, all our policies and procedures to make sure that that gets done in an appropriate time in a regular way for the most efficient purposes. That to me is, is the management side, but what drives the management side really is the culture. What is our vision for the organization? What are the values for our organization? How do we want to treat one another uh, as we go forward? And that's the work is, the, is that, that is the work of leadership. What's our philosophy? Um, and because that drives our system strategies and structures. So what we're talking about is developing a higher performing organization is not just providing having people be, do individual leadership which is important, trying to do project management and trying to go past the travails that we have all the time and, and what we call adaptive leadership to, to do those things that nobody else can, can answer. There's no direct answer to. But it is the context of how we do that collectively in an environment. How are we leaders to go ahead and make sure that we are enfranchising everybody in the conversation and that we are not requiring people to do it our, our way necessarily, but have an open conversation where we can ch have ourselves be challenged uh, and say that uh, what is the best solution for this particular problem going forward? Uh, and how do we take time to go ahead and do that? Um, so I find that we spend a great deal of time about leadership, individual leadership, but very little time on what sort of organizational culture do we want to have? Um, so that, that really is what it's about, is trying to go ahead and create that environment um, where uh, people are really meaningfully engaged on a regular basis and working toward that, that, that process. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that explanation. In preparing for this interview, you told me that, quote, culture eats process and procedures for lunch. What does that mean for today's local government leaders? Well, that's a great expression from Peter Drucker, so I didn't invent it. So it's been okay. around for a long time, uh, and that's what he believed about as well. Uh, what it means is that irrespective of your, of your system strategies and structures, your policy manuals and so forth, what it really comes down to is how do we do it here? Uh, oh, yeah, I know that we need to do Form 8516, but guess what? Nobody ever looks at it, and so you don't need to really deal with that stuff. Uh, you know, do it this way. Um, you know, uh, the, the policy says that, we, that you can go ahead and take off vacation, but really we don't, we don't appreciate people doing that off here and those sort of things. It is really how we operate as opposed to what we, how we say we're going to operate. Um, so uh, the best policy and procedures manuals are not worth anything unless the culture reinforces it, good or bad. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is an item that culture is evolved over time, and it is handed down from previous generations, if you will, almost, uh, from previous individuals who are in the organization. And it's tough to go ahead and change, uh, and it's tough to, or to influence in a positive way, so it takes a lot of nurturing that way. And I'll reinforce again the, the idea that um, I see it with, with, with our students. Our students are, they are chomping at the bit to go ahead and do the public good. They want to go ahead and make changes right now, and they want to go ahead and kind of use their full talents, but they get into some organizations, and the environment is caustic. Nobody listens to them. Nobody wants to take their ideas. Nobody wants to go ahead and use their energies. Uh, they just want to go ahead and kind of continue what they're doing all along. And that's not just those that are younger people. It's students, people that mm -hmm. indeed that want to go ahead and do something differently. I have students that are in their mid-40s, in their 50s, that want to change careers, and they experience the same thing going into an organization which is not going to be appreciative of what they have to bring to them. So it's what I call basically that the culture we're trying to establish is one that has a uh, an adult-to-adult -adult relationship versus a parent-child relationship. Most organizations deal with parent-child. Here's how we do it. I want to go ahead and do we need to go and mow the, the yards this way. Got to use this amount of flu. We show up at eight and then at five. You know, it's very prescriptive stuff as opposed to saying that, you know, we, our job is to go and make sure the, the the parks are beautifully manicured and maintained within this budget amount so that people feel like they are safe and that it becomes a positive, you know, a, a positive reflection of our community. Go forth and do great things. Allowing that person to go ahead and say, I want to mow it, you know, in a circular passion versus left, right, left, right gives them more engagement. They actually might do it might do it better. And that really is more of an adult to adult relationship than a parent child relationship. Um, so that's what I mean by by uh, culture eating process, you know, culture eats process and procedures for lunch. Uh, it, it really uh, how you do things, how you really do things becomes important at local government versus what you say you're going to be doing. 
Another thing that you shared with me that you've done in your high performance organizations is um, ask employees to keep a, this seems stupid to me journal. Um, Tell us more about that and maybe some good ideas that have come out of those that you've acted upon. Yeah, this seems stupid to me. Another person gave me that idea. Actually, one of our one of our county commissioners, which is I adopted it, and, and but a good thing I used to do that with regards to new employee orientation. Um, and I would ask them to go ahead and because when when a new person comes to your organization, irrespective of age, they are approaching your organization with new eyes. Uh, and you may have experienced it when you go to a conference as well. You come in there and you look at it differently. What we don't do is we don't we don't act upon those. We don't record those to say uh, we should do things differently. Here's, a, here's another example. When we moved in from Hayes uh, to our house in, in Johnson County, um, uh, we adapted. We noted that indeed there was a hole in the garage. We we're going to fix the paneling, and so if we noted that the uh, that the uh, the toilet, the kind of the, you had to jiggle the handle to go ahead and stop it from from leaking and so forth. Did we go ahead and change those things? No, we adapted. We put a picture over the hall, the hole in the wall in the garage. We did, we've now tell you the, the orientation for when you come to our house. You got to jiggle the handle in the in the in the guest restroom to go out and make it work, as opposed to fixing the problem. Were we to record it uh, to go ahead and say we need to fix this problem and act upon it, we would have a different house. And the same thing for employees. So we'd say keep a journal with you, and say you know this seems stupid to me. Why are we doing form eighty five sixteen three times? Because if we can't justify it, then we probably should get rid of it. If we can justify, then we should explain to the employee why it's important to do it, and that establishes the culture. Uh, the things that came out of that, I think, were uh, were regards to some larger items. Is saying, um, gosh, uh, one of the items we had a snowstorm uh, that really inundated. Go figure, snowstorms right now really inundated the airport. So uh, one of the new employees were saying, you know, we we need to go ahead and plow the airport and, and get it going. So we want all the gear. Why don't we talk to the uh, public works department and borrow some of their equipment to get the runways open? Good idea. Great. You know, it's, this seems stupid to me that we've got all the gear, but we're not using it where we can use it right now today. So the employee goes, given the, you know, made the connections and so forth and said, can we borrow equipment? The relationships were established enough to go and create a trusting relationship that indeed, yeah, uh, equipment was borrowed. People came over and they had to open up the the airport. They opened the airport and they kind of traded resources back and forth. So that that's an indication about uh, people questioning about how we do things the old way and then making it for a good event and a good result for the public purpose. Uh, you know, there were many other examples of like that that came forward. I think some of the the uh, new employees were reluctant to bring those things forward, but we're trying to create the culture where people start listening to it. And that, that's one of the big part of the of a culture is uh, how receptive are supervisors and department heads and other air people of authority to accept that indeed they may not, they may not have all the right answers. Uh, I think that's one of the big issues about developing a culture of, of constant improvement or high performing organization is what's the attitude for those in positions of authority uh, to kind of be receptive to different ideas. So that's an yeah. example. Yeah, very interesting. And in that example you gave, you know, you you highlighted again the importance of relationships and building trust in relationships. And that's really a lot of what you're doing in your role as a professor of practice, trying to apply, apply the academic to the practical, which leads me to my next question of you know, how do you create these high performance organizations in a post COVID-19 world where we are more frequently working remotely. Um, there's this kind of this notion of quiet quitting that's surfacing in the workforce. Um, how, how do you address those things and, and continue to create high performance organizations? Well, I, I think you, you do not become, you do, you're not, uh, I, when you talk about COVID-19, really, what I think you're talking about is doing things by virtu- uh, in a virtual environment as opposed to being in, in person. And for me, uh, the, uh, the electronic ways to discussion is a, a way of how to do our relationship building versus actually doing the relationship building. To me, I think they're separate issues. Having a culture of high performance really is an attitude. It is establishing a way of how you interact with one another, how you work in a team environment in a real legitimate way. Um, and it is uh, having that culture and having that desire to work together in a collaborative way, you work around the electronic means. 
Uh, I, I can tell you that that in some of the during COVID-19, there were some relationships that were enhanced by cult, by by COVID-19 by virtue of being able to go across, well, ha having distance be irrelevant in in providing our conversations. Uh, we're meeting today remotely, sure. uh, obviously. Uh, many Zoom calls, I have the good fortune of being with people across the country. I could never have done that if I had to go in and get a plane and go in and kind of travel around that way. So uh, it, it is the attitude. It is your ability to go ahead and listen and listen with intent, uh, to go ahead and contribute appropriately, to be engaged with those conversations that creates the trusting relationship that I think is, is different from and is irrelevant somewhat about the way that that is done. Um, so I, I think it's attitudinal more than it is uh, the conveyance. I think we use it sometimes as an excuse to not really have meaningful conversations and not really trying to go ahead and have a meaningful relationship that we're paying attention. Um, let's go back to the basics. Uh, I'm getting a feel to a degree, uh, but what I think in, in electronic mediums, we are disconnected. How many of us are actually looking at something else when we're supposed to be on the Zoom meeting? How many of us are really listening to go ahead and provide a comment and how we're going to respond as opposed to actually intently listening about what's being said? Uh, listening with intent versus listening for the purpose of reaction are two different things. And that helps enhance relationships uh, in, in my view. So uh, quiet quitting, let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's go back to the basics. The, the issues, and I'm a real fan of, of Daniel Pink's book, Drive. If you've not read it, and your listeners should, it boils down for me to be three basic concepts, that the motivating employees, people today, are basically three different things. Employees want to have autonomy, mastery, and purpose in their jobs. Once, indeed, everything has been dealt with as far as hygiene factors. And we know from uh, research data that pay and benefits are hygiene factors. You want to make sure that you're being compensated appropriately, that you're not being compensated in a, in a, uh, unfairly compared to your peers. I would also add that for uh, for those on this on this site, you know, us, us as public servants, I hope to not get in this profession to make a lot of money. We don't want to be uh, uncompensated unfairly, want to have a good life and so forth, but we're not there generally to go ahead and increase our portfolio necessarily. And if so, then I would offer that people are in this profession for the wrong reasons. We should be doing this stuff for the public good. But once indeed that that has been fed, met as far as our hygiene factors, the reason why people stay and or don't stay is because of those things. The, the idea of, of can I do my job by myself and not be micromanaged? Is there enough trust in me that I can accomplish my, my, my work the way I think it's going to be done most effective? And do I have those, those tools and the skills to go ahead and do that? Are they giving me opportunities to go ahead and grow my skills or make myself skills that are appropriate? So autonomy and mastery. And the third area really talks about purpose. Am I, for what reasons am I doing this kind of work? Uh, and I think for us in government, we have that in large measure because we, we should be, in my viewpoint, doing it because uh, it is leaving our communities better than we found it, the, the Athenian oath. People leave organizations and leave their, uh, their, uh, their bosses, if you will. Uh, as opposed to for, for other reasons here uh, that, you know, that, that, that might be available uh, to them. Uh, that is certainly the issues about remote work and can I go and remote, can I work remotely versus living at home? I mean, going into the office are issues one has to be discussed and kind of work through the environment here, uh, which I think are appropriate. The issues about work-life balance are certainly part of that and that is part of developing a culture of performing as well. What is the environment you have? How do you value employees and how do you value their work? Really, uh, if we have a policy that indeed you can take off time uh, to go and be with your, your young baby and so forth and create the culture that is fostered. It's not mm -hmm. just on paper, but will people feel ostracized if they don't do that? Again, these are things that I think are different that are being talked about more vigorously because of COVID-19. But I don't think that really is the death knell or so forth with regards to developing the culture. If the culture is established, people want to work together for a common purpose. They feel like they're supported. They will find ways to uh, achieve the mission irrespective of having to do so electronically. Yeah, that's great. I think you're giving some really good advice and reminders here of just the basics. I mean, man, I feel convicted about practicing good listening skills being focused in that Zoom meeting, not multitasking and doing another thing, not thinking about what you want to say when someone else is speaking. It's so easy to lapse back into those bad habits. And I think we all have to be really intentional about practicing good listening and relationship skills, no matter what the format is, in person or virtual. Isn't that the truth? And I wish I was not a 
violator of that. I've been a violator as well, you know, uh, especially when you've got 48 tiles you've got to look at. Um, and I have to constantly say, you know, stay engaged, stay engaged. I get yeah. it. It doesn't make it, make it any easier. But I think recognizing that, that that's, that's the value we can add. Uh, and that's how we develop the relationships. And that's how we have a culture. And you know what we, you know, viscerally, I think, what I'm saying when we talk about it. Even in a Zoom meeting, are your words going to be held? Are people, is everyone, is the facilitator willing to go ahead and make sure everybody's engaged? Make yeah. sure that everybody has a chance to contribute? And are you yourself contributing? Or are you just sitting as a bump on the log to kind of saying, well, this is a born, da, 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 da. what is your contribution? So it is a two-way street. Uh, I think I think doing electronic means Zoom, whatever, choose your, your pathway of choice. Um, I think are teren- tremendous tools if we have the relationship established to make sure that they're meaningful. Right. And that, that takes time and that takes effort on everyone's part to, to make to make that work. I do think that we're developing now in the we're gonna to have to be mindful in the COVID nineteen world between work that workers that cannot have the opportunity to do things electronically and those that can. A street worker has to drive the vehicle and we've got to make sure that they're valuable and valued uh, and that they they are uh, appropriately heard about how they can be more flexible in their work schedule, something that we that many can do that are working remotely. Some people do not want to work remotely and want to be in, engaging that way. And I think that's good also. I think we also have to be, be uh, more thoughtful about the reasons for being together uh, physically uh, and celebrate that. If indeed it is relationship building, then let's go ahead and work on relationship building when we're in the same room together. I've been in several organizations where everyone is in the same place building but they're literally on the same zoom call yeah. uh, in their own cubicles how ridiculous is that from my viewpoint you're in the same building i got it but now you've just basically wasted all the gas and so forth to get to that building for what purpose so if we're going to value being together let's all right, let's be more thoughtful about why we're getting together and what we're trying to accelerate by being in the same location together um, yeah. that's a long-winded answer but i think to, to the issue about you create high performing organizations by developing the relationships and understanding the culture you're trying to do you know, electronic means is a way to go and communicate but it's not the death knell, I think, to that communication. Yeah. It's good reminders. Um, well, I certainly recommend any of our listeners to take your executive leadership seminar or other trainings focused on high performance organizations, but short of doing that, um, what is the number one thing that our listeners can do to create a culture of high performance in their organizations? Well, be, before I do that, I want to kind of put a plug in from our, our, our program, which we have sure. basically used the uh, uh, high performing organization model from the Senior Executive Institute that used to be at the University of Virginia, uh, now is uh, in, in, Charlotte's, uh, in Charleston, I believe. Um, but we've used a lot of their work from Bob Matson and others to uh, really bring this this idea of high performing organizations to fruition. And that's, we're just basically using a lot of that material as well, plus adding to contemporary work in a one week seminar about how to develop, how to lead uh, organizational culture improvement, uh, high performing organizations. Uh, so uh, there are many good places that do this kind of work. We're one of that group and hope people, if you don't get it from our organization, find somebody who does. Now let's talk about the idea of what really are the most, uh, the, the, um, things they can do to create a culture of high performance. I think the most important things uh, is to not, uh, is to understand that not having the answer uh, it, it, it is, is okay. Uh, it, 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 in my view, it's having the courage to have your own viewpoints challenged, is what I would say, um, is to honestly reflect upon where you think your organization culture is without what you think you'd like it to be, but really taking a moment and saying, how, how do I, what kind of culture do we currently have? Uh, and what am I doing to inhibit or contribute to the culture that we have? And am I willing to go ahead and examine my own beliefs and behaviors uh, that I may indeed not be the, the person that has to make all the decisions? I'll, I'll tell you, when I started, I was being city manager and so forth. I felt like I had to have all the answers. And I felt that my viewpoint was that if I didn't have the answers, I was a failure that I wasn't doing my job. People were coming to me for, for the answers. I'm the answer guy, uh, which means that basically I can't ever sleep and so forth. I have come to realize that my job really is to be uh, to be competent in my work. There are times I have to go ahead and be the leader, no question about it, and just decide to make decisions. Uh, but 
I also have to provide a, a space that in, allows people to go and bring their full measure of their talent together as well. And I had to allow myself to be challenged that I may not have the right answer, that indeed the way mm -hmm. I'm thinking about things may be wrong or inappropriate. Uh, and uh, I had to change myself. I had to change the way that I think about people and the way that I kind of add, uh, add value or sometimes deter value by what I do. I will also tell you that one thing that doing the Senior Executive Institute did, it allowed me to think about our work in terms that motivated me to be in this work to begin with. The idea that I was advancing democratic values, that I was trying to go ahead and improve communities wherever I could, that I wanted to leave things better than I found them. And I would say that a lot, but I really believe that. Prior to that, I, I was ignoring that fundamental issues about why we do this work. And I become more uh, understanding about we should talk a lot more about why we do something and less about how and what. We forget about the why we're doing this because the why that we do it provides us the energy and provides us the passion to go ahead and persevere through the what to get that done. Uh, and being mindful of the values, we, we are, we are um, disciples, I'll use that term, of democratic values in American society. And so how we do something is as important as what we do, but the why we do it becomes so very important because we believe in our democratic values. We want to build communities that, that includes everybody, uh, that no one should be left behind. And we take everyone's viewpoint into consideration, irrespective of our internal biases, uh, that we try to develop a pathway that meets all those concerns to our best of our ability, yet reflecting that we are uh, agents of a democratic society, not the ones that rule. We are leaders, not rulers of what we're doing, and we have to abide by democratic votes that come down the, the pike. You know, our job is to propose and the, uh, the elected officials is to dispose. Um, so I guess the thing I would say you know, most importantly is to, uh, is to reflect upon and have our own ideas challenged, uh, to look about what we are doing or not doing to develop the culture that we have in place and recognize that there is a culture and recognize that we can indeed modify the culture if we don't like it. Long-winded answer again. No. Those, those, are, those are things that, that come to mind that's as I great. think about it. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, Hannes. I think that's um, it takes a little courage and vulnerability as a leader to, to be able to say confidently, I don't have all the answers, but my role is to help you achieve your best so you can help bring your the full measure of your talent, as you said. Um, I think that's a really strong reminder for our audience, so thank you. Yeah, I think to add to that, if I can, the idea that yeah. there is to study as well, uh, be, be constant learners uh, in, in the process. And those who are listeners appreciate that. Never stop learning. I have found in my career that the more I learn, the more I understand that I still have things to learn. Um, uh, so there, there is that, that desire. One thing I would encourage listeners to look at is to look at the Likert scale. Uh, Mr. Likert uh, uh, developed the scale back uh, in the, you know, 1930s, 1940s, and you know what right now, the one through five scale and so forth as he established. Well, he also established ways to go ahead and think about how we, how organizations perform uh, and how they, they develop, the, how organizations led. And the organizational systems, he came up with systems one, two, three, and four, and you'll recognize this pretty quickly. Systems one are, is basically is a leader that is an exploitive uh, autocrat. Just do what I'm telling you as far as that's concerned. A system two is a benevolent autocrat, one individual that uh, I will take your, uh, I, I will give you lip service to your ideas, but it's really going to be my decision at the end. And migrating to systems three and four, being a consultative leader or a participative leader. A consultative leader is one that indeed says, I'm going to take your information legitimately. I need to make the final decision, but I really want to understand how you think I should approach this problem. What sort of answers should come forward in a very, very genuine and I think inclusive way. And system four talks about participants, says, I don't need to go and make the decision. I am willing to go ahead and make sure that the collective body can make the decision, and I'll support that. What I encourage your, your listeners to do is to understand more about Likert scale and figure out where are they on that continuum in their leadership area. Uh, and this is not just those who are in positions of authority, but in your work team. How do you, are, are you a person that approaches and saying it's my way or the highway? or giving lip service to people without really kind of considering their viewpoint? Or are you a person that will indeed honestly consider people's viewpoint and go along with the decision of the group? Or if indeed, are there decisions that I can leave the group to go ahead and do and I will take a supportive role whatever the group comes forward? 
that's self-governance. Yeah. That is understanding where you are on that continuum and knowing that there are different ways to do it. And I will tell you, in my experience, operating uh, in a system three or system four is the most productive and the most rewarding way to go and do leadership in an organization that I've been able to come across. Okay. Thank you. You've given us a lot to think about in this episode. Is there anything else that you want to share before we wrap up? Uh, I think, yeah, the thing I'd share is that changing organ or improving organizational culture takes time. Uh, in Johnson County government, which I think has done a pretty good job, not whole, not, not in all parts, but a pretty good job. We've been at this for about 20, 30 years. <laughs> the most recently when I did it for about, about seven. So it takes a while to kind of amplify people's uh, the culture. But I will tell you that the juice is worth the squeeze. That's the term I would say. Uh, sharing resources in a much more uh, efficient way. Uh, having employees do better community service because they're feeling motivated. Uh, employee retention is up by virtue of providing a culture. We want to go and stay and feel like they're full measure, even indeed when resources are restricted. Uh, and fundamentally to have a better and more beautiful community than what we had before. All those are end results, I think, of developing a culture of higher performance or a culture where everybody feels valuable and valued. That's great. Hannes, thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom with us in this episode. Um, we have one final question for you as we wrap up. If you could be the GovLove DJ, what song would you pick as our exit music for this episode? I guess what I would choose is a song by, by Johnny Reed. It's called Today I'm Going to Try and Change the World. That's what I would put forward. Great message for our local government audience. Well, that ends our episode today. I want to thank so much um, a person I admire, our guest, Hannah Zacharias, for being on our episode. And to our audience, thank you so much for listening. If you have questions or ideas for future podcast episodes, uh, we want to hear them. You can reach us at elgl.org slash govlove or on Twitter at govlovepodcast. This has been GovLove, a podcast about local government. I'm gonna try and change the world. I'm gonna say hello to my neighbor. I'm gonna greet him with a smile. And shake the hand of a stranger. Sit and talk to him for a while. I'm gonna tell someone I love them from the bottom of I'm gonna try to change the world